Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to uh, present my paper. Actually, that was done with my uh, master student, Maxim Shorokov. Uh, that's uh, a topic maybe not very common for this uh, TMPA conference because it's dedicated to user interfaces. So, so far I've mostly seen the analysis dedicated to code, but I think that user interfaces are also pretty important. So, uh, I'm going to tell about some work that we did uh, related to kind of automated uh, testing or assessment of user interfaces. So, do you see my slides changing? Okay, that's fine. So, a few words about the motivation. So, why do we want the automation of this? Because, uh, well, each user interface works uh, in a specific context uh, of interaction. And if you consider the number of websites that we have nowadays, uh, the number of mobile users and web users, each of which are basically different, and also the number of devices for each of which uh, user interface has to be tailored, then you can uh, see that it's no longer possible kind of to just handcraft uh, user interfaces like we used to do, like the designer or a graphic designer or web designer or <clears throat> UI designer or user experience specialist, whatever. Uh, they do not... Um, have the economic capability to craft every interface. So we need automation in this field. And uh, the traditional approach is the same as analyzing the program code. So basically you take the code of a user interface and perform the analysis, uh, which is a, a sort of static testing. So you have the code and you analyze it. And actually it's proven to be uh, quite successful in some aspects. For example, to check in accessibility aspects, uh, compliance to, for example, usability standards, and so on. And also, it's pretty easy to do with uh, the code, is particularly for web user interfaces, because HTML and CSS, they usually uh, easily accessible. So you just take the code of any web page that you have, <clears throat> and you're ready to analyze, basically. But still, there are some restrictions, some things that this uh, type of analysis cannot do. So we are, with my uh, team, working uh, in the field of visual analysis of user interfaces. So uh, it's uh, a dynamic test in, in a way. So, uh, for example, a web interface has to be rendered uh, in a browser. And then we can take this screenshot or whatever and uh, use today's uh, quite advanced image recognition technologies. For example, to recognize uh, UI elements, uh, like you can see in this picture. Uh, well, it's still computationally pretty expensive. So depending on the uh, kind of fidelity, what exactly you want to extract and test, it might take tens or even hundreds of seconds for each screenshot. And also, you need quite a lot of training data to, uh, for example, identify the UI elements, <clears throat> because uh, the machine learning uh, models that we have, they are usually tailored to uh, general images, not to user interfaces. And getting enough training data is not always easy. But the advantages is that uh, this kind of analysis can see exactly what the user sees. So uh, you can analyze uh, layouts, uh, some color-related aspects, uh, sizes, for example, uh, they might be important for some elder people or something. And uh, also, you don't have to care, uh, kind of try to model the device. You just render it in a platform that your target user is going to use, and you just have what the user will see. So uh, also, it's uh, well understandably unlike analysis of code it's uh, useful for analyzing some uh, visual perception related aspects uh, such as visual complexity visual aesthetics and some uh, emotional aspects uh, which are pretty important nowadays so uh, we actually had a previous uh, publication you can see uh, the reference at the bottom and in that work, we uh, proposed the method uh, for uh, kind of overlaying uh, a grid, uh, the layout grids on uh, real web user interfaces. It roughly corresponds uh, to a screen test 
that you might know from visibility engineering when you just squint at your design and trying to make sense of it. Uh, basically, you decrease the visual fidelity so you don't see any individual elements anymore. But uh, you want to know if you can still make sense uh, about the visual organization. Uh, what is the header, what is the um, footer, what is the main text and image and so on. So you still want uh, the layout uh, and the visual hierarchy to be graspable. So what we did was also that we overlaid uh, a two-dimensional grid over images of open interfaces. And we assigned either zero or one in each cell, depending uh, is there mostly content in the cell, then it's one, or is it mostly just some blank space or maybe white space, <clears throat> just some background, uh, that would be zero. And it's a way, <clears throat> in a way it's a reverse engineering because uh, that's how the user interfaces are designed because designers nowadays, they align elements uh, to grids. And because we don't have access to the mockups, understandably, we, we just want to analyze any user interface possible, then we kind of take a step back uh, to the design. So this way, uh, we eliminate some details, such as colors, uh, some styles of uh, UI elements, and so on. But we keep, as I said, uh, the visual hierarchy. So that's especially uh, good uh, to analyze the layout. And especially we kind of highlight uh, the Gestalt principles. So it's a model uh, for the perception in a way. And well, a few words about that, of course, you know. Uh, this school of Gestalt psychology, which was not as much about psychology as about perception actually, uh, it used this principle of uh, arranging kind of what's uh, a human thinks comes uh, in a group and what does not. So <clears throat> probably the main principle of grouping is proximity. So in the example, you can see that you perceive uh, on the right kind of the three groups of elements because of the principle of proximity. And also they uh, identified principles of similarity, uh, similarity in shape and color and size and so on. Uh, also, there were some more, and also some interesting things, how your brain tries to make sense out of everything. So uh, you have some random black and white uh, objects, basically. But for example, in A, you see a triangle and some squares. So your brain tries to organize it in a meaningful way, in a more simple way. And uh, that's actually... Uh, your brain can do a lot of tricky things. For example, in this uh, illusion, most people would say that the square A is darker than the square B, right? But they are basic, basically the same. So you can see that there is no difference, just your brain compensates. So uh, actually, uh, the existence of Gestalt principles is supported by uh, a lot of research work. There's uh, soon going to be 100 years. So uh, in our previous research work, we uh, had kind of a manual implementation of our uh, approach. So we relied on students who would just overlay the grids manually on the websites. So the result would look like that. You can see zeros and ones. And naturally, we wanted to automate that because, well, 20 websites uh, is nothing and manual work uh, is too labor intensive. And in that work, we actually, uh, wh why did we want that? Because we found out that uh, our approach uh, to uh, kind of predict visual complexity without humans works pretty well uh, with uh, compression algorithms such as um, Deflate and RLE and uh, Higgs law. So we built some regression uh, equations in that paper and found that we are able to predict how complex uh, a website would look uh, to a user. So that's pretty interesting. And of course, as I said, we wanted to automate that. So the research objective of our current work is that we want to automate the construction of these layout grids on top of screenshots. And we developed a software tool for that. Uh, that implements the algorithm 
and we relied on OpenCV, of course, and also did some programming. And then we performed the validation of this with almost 500 of websites and uh, assessments of visual perception that we collected from 70 subjects. So now uh, in more detail about the algorithm. The first step was edge detection. Uh, well, actually, I need to say that that was the implementation uh, by my master student, and we most relied on pretty standard, uh, a combination of pretty standard uh, approaches, but I hope that we put them together in an interesting way. So we removed the noise uh, and clutter and uh, the gradient, and then we performed the edge detection using uh, a pretty conventional command. And then we get some, well, out of the image of UI, we get uh, something like that. So in the next step, we want to pixelate the image so uh, that the pixels are kind of more uh, obvious for the algorithm. So we would reduce the size of the image and then we would recover it uh, to the original size. So again, uh, OpenCV function, a uh, pretty conventional resize function. And then we get uh, out of the pixel uh, out of the edge detection that we did in the previous step, we get a pixelated image which looks something like that. So then we want to actually overlay the grid uh, onto uh, the pixelated image. <clears throat> so uh, since uh, the websites are generally first organized by columns. So first, designers decide how many columns they're going to have. And then in each column, they arrange the elements. So our algorithms uh, also starts the analysis by columns. So it wants to draw vertical lines. It looks for continuous segments of black and white pixels. And depending on the several parameters, it decides whether or not it should make a column here. And then the same is done uh, after we, do, we have identified the columns for each of them independently, we uh, identify the rows. So what elements are basically located in each of them. So, and on this step from the pixelated image, uh, we get uh, the grid looking something like that. And next we want to code the cells. So we want to assign either zeros or ones <clears throat> and actually, <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, this is uh, not straightforward because um, it might depend uh, on the perception of different categories of users. For example, something that would look uh, cluttered in a cell, for example, for an elder person or some cognitive impaired person uh, would look like a zero, like there's almost nothing there for a more experienced person. But still, we settled uh, at least currently uh, on three percent. So basically, if we have three percent of white pixels uh, in a the cell, then we consider it to be one. And we are still working on this automatic tuning of the parameters and linking them uh, to target user groups. So, and then after we've done that, we recover the original image. Mm -hmm. And the good thing is that uh, now we can just send hundreds of images uh, to the algorithm in a batch mode. It would be just processing each one of them and just providing the result and so we can use the output for some research. So we have uh, agreed and we recovered the original image and we have uh, zeros and ones. Uh, for example, uh, here it would look something like that. <clears throat> Uh, an illustration of how the parameters can affect uh, the grid, for example. So here uh, in the left side, you can see the navigation uh, is uh, arranged with too many rows, with too many ones. And semantically, it's basically the same cell, right? So it's the navigation. So we can uh, adjust the parameters, for example, this one, set it to three. And uh, then we can get a more kind of semantical logical distribution. Uh, same here. Uh, that's a kind of internet of our university. Uh, we have uh, probably too many columns and rows. So by adjusting the parameters, we can get uh, more, I think, like reverse engineered 
structure. So that's what designer uh, intended. So then the validation part. Uh, as I said, we used uh, almost 500 screenshots of university websites. We automatically collected them uh, from the web, and then we uh, <clears throat> kind of discarded the ones that did not load automatically well, like that had some um, broken images or some, I don't know, automated warnings like accept cookies or everything. So that's why uh, the number is not exactly 500. And then we had 70 uh, subjects, participants in the experiment, mostly students of our university, but also some people working in IT. We wanted to collect their subjective assessments of complexity, aesthetics, and orderliness. That were the dependent variable. The like scale was from one to seven. And then uh, the independent variables were produced by our algorithm. So we had the number of columns, the number of rows, uh, the number of cells. And also, uh, we introduced kind of a derived uh, independent variable white space. That's the percentage, uh, basically the percentage of zeros that we have uh, among the total number of our cells. And so then we had more than 4,000 full evaluations, uh, each for uh, the three scales of complexity, aesthetics, and orderliness. And so we averaged uh, for each screenshot. And then we used linear regression, a uh, pretty simple method, because we just wanted to know if it's meaningful or not. Uh, we wanted to select uh, the significant factors and use the backwards variable selection method. So what we got was, well, it can be summarized in this table. It's also in the paper. So what's interesting is that white space uh, was significant for all the dependent variables, which I think is uh, reasonable because as every designer knows that white space is the most powerful, probably uh, factor that can be adjusted if you want to influence visual perception. And also, although R squares were not very high, especially for complexity where just one factor was significant uh, the very the regression equations for all the three dependent variables were highly significant so that uh, could not happen by chance and we conclude that our algorithm uh, do produce some meaningful results and you might remember that the, for the manual uh, overlaying of the grid we had R squares, uh, something like 0 0.3, so a bit higher. But there we had just about 20 websites, so that's uh, much less. So here, explaining this percentage of variability by something that we get from an automated uh, software, I think, is not that bad. So coming to the conclusions. Uh, first of all, I hope that I managed to persuade you that your eye testing and analysis is at least as important as uh, just uh, software code analysis and testing. And there are two main approaches. One is more traditional one, uh, fast and accurate. And <clears throat> it's widely used already, but still it has some limitations. So we are working uh, in the field of image-based UI analysis which is a slower and less sure and has some other disadvantages but it can see what the user sees which i think is a pretty important advantage and in our previous work we uh, proposed uh, a sort of screen test that uh, removes uh, details except the ones meaningful for the visual layout of web user interfaces and in that work, we found that uh, the factors that we get out of this, they uh, can be pretty useful to predict visual complexity. So we wanted to automate that. And in the current work, we did that. And um, we now can overlay uh, this kind of grids and kind of perform this reverse engineering to what the designers actually wanted uh, the columns and rows to be. The implementation is based uh, on the pretty standard functions of OpenCV library. And we are still working on uh, the parameters uh, that uh, the algorithm uses because they, as I demonstrated, can affect the outcome uh, pretty much. And also we want to 
adjust these parameters automatically depending on um, the category of target users that we want to <clears throat> uh, access the perception for. So I think this is it. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, please go ahead.